is dedicated to promoting reading success for all. We attack illiteracy from three angles. We give teachers evidence-based strategies to teach reading. We provide parents of struggling readers with support and information. And we teach adults to read. Giving the kids the Nye House strategies and letting them know that they can compete with anyone, that's our passion. Hi, I'm Tim Odegaard, and I was asked to give you this presentation today. So sit back, enjoy, hopefully you're in something comfy since we're still in virtual Zoom land, um, and you got some fuzzy slippers on because we're about to launch into a short presentation about leveraging student data to gain a larger perspective. Now, this is not going to be like your usual presentation in some ways. I'm going to be a little tongue-in-cheek and cheeky with this. I'm going to break it up into three acts as if I was a screenwriter here. Act one is going to be a talk that you might expect to see. In fact, in Ohio, you can hop over to the Department of Education's website and you can see a variation on this talk on demand through their um, website right there. And we're going to talk about screening students using screening data, and I call it the canonical or the typical talk, what you would expect to see. Act two, I've been told continually that when I take this perspective, it's unique to a lot of people. So it may not be unique to all, but I'm hearing that this is a slightly different way of thinking and talking about student data. So we're going to think a little bit bigger, and I'm going to share with you how we might tap into something that I think that often we don't tap into. And from the feedback I'm receiving across the country, as I give and I talk about these things, and I work with districts and schools and states to gain this perspective, I hear that it is something that's somewhat different and unique. And then Act 3 is, is really to speak to even a larger issue, and that's about accountability and who we hold accountable, but more importantly, what we hold them accountable for and to ask ourselves, is it really in their power to be held accountable because it's something that they can actually engage in and have full empowered control over? So act one, the canonical top. Let's set the scene. So here we are on a stage in Zoom. I'm in this. You're in hopefully something far comfier. Hopefully you do have proper beverage next to you and you can stay either caffeinated, hydrated, or however you'd like to hydrate or caffeinate yourself. And let's go from here. We make a tremendous investment of time and money, two precious resources, in testing students. And we do this multiple times every year. But we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with these data? What are we doing with them? What are you doing with them? What does the school do with them? What does the state do with them? What does the teacher do with them? What does the parent do with them? Most discussions of what to do with student data focus on procedures for testing students, how we're supposed to do it, and then how can we change something and what Wanzak and Alateba call organizationally to intensify instruction, if we get to the instructional. So then act one is gonna be a variation on this theme. I'm gonna truncate it because I wanna to get to the other two acts um, and let's get going. So first thing that you're gonna to have to do when you think about testing students and set intention and be mindful of what you're trying to do. You're gonna to wanna to make the time spent testing matter for you and your students if you're a teacher with mindfulness and tension. You need to ask yourself, why am I testing? What do I wanna know when I do this testing and how will I use this information to improve instruction for my students? So let me ask you, are you screening for future risk or are you looking to find out which students right now can't read and spell in your classrooms? You know, those are the core characteristics of dyslexia right there in a school-aged child. Can't read or spell very well. Maybe you're screening for that. Maybe you're progress monitoring. Maybe you've identified kids who need a little bit more oomph, and you're going to progress to see if they're getting to where they need to go. Are they making those slow incremental gains to 
inflect that learning curve up so they can close the gap and get on grade level expectations. Are you evaluating a student's competency in comparison to their peers in their classroom, in their school, in their district, or maybe with a larger understanding of what they should be able to do, a criterion? Like if you're a third grader, should you be able to read some multisyllabic words? Heck yeah, you should. So if I give you some type of a criterion reference measure and I item analysis and see that you can't read a single one of those things, as an interventionist, I'm a little concerned. And I'm gonna to wanna to focus in on and find out why you're not able to read some of those multisyllabic words, if any. And I'm gonna be strategic about what I do to intensify and give you a little bit of help so you can overcome those barriers. Maybe you're trying to determine if a student is learning a concept that you taught. You're going back. Maybe you're using a program like Foundations, maybe 95% group, maybe something else. And you've taught them certain concepts. And maybe you're going to use some unit assessments or some type of a test to see, have they learned what I've taught them? Question number one, are they learning what I'm teaching? Question number two, is what I'm teaching them getting to where they need to be? Am I meeting standards right now in this grade? Or maybe you want to do something altogether different with those. No clue, you do what you do, you do you. So ask yourself again, why am I testing in the first place? What do I want to know? And how will I use this information to improve instruction for my kiddos? If you're a teacher and if I'm a parent, what am I looking at? Most parents I speak with don't even know what those reports are that they're seeing. A lot of learning to be done, a lot of insights to be made. So when we talk about formal student data, it's going to be used differently based on the intention, why you're doing it in the first place. Formal assessments, just to set the stage, refers to tests that are valid, reliable, and standardized. We will go over each of these terms. The tests are given in a standard way. That's the standardization. Informal tests are often used in addition during instruction to determine whether students understand what is being taught. Those are helpful too. Those are different. Informal assessments, yep, do those need it, but we also use these formal assessments in most implementations in the early grades of reading. What's one type of formal assessment we do? Universal screening. So screening assessments are these formal tests that are going to be given to provide a quick indicator of student skills to reveal which students are predicted to meet grade level benchmarks now and in the future. So it tells me what can they do now, but a well calibrated and the most useful universal screening tools tell you if they're on track and what they'll be like in let's say six months to a year from now. Will they be able to be on track to do what they need to do? So they're very useful and that they have these different aspects to them. They tell you what's happening now and they're predictive of what the future might hold for this student. Diagnostic assessment. In some states and other places we call this survey level assessment. These are still going to be quick and easy to administer, test, and they're going to provide more in-depth information about what underlying skills and sources of knowledge are potentially hindering a student's ability to meet expectations on an assessment given for universal screening. These should be based on an understanding of the skills needed to perform the skill being assessed through universal screening within a developmental model. So, on most universal screenings, the word reading indicators we get after a certain grade, let's say second grade and beyond for many instances, is going to be a measure of oral reading fluency. Now, oral reading fluency could be this fluency that when under pressure we become a little more inaccurate, or it could be due to the fact that their accuracy hasn't even been established in the first place. It could be the case that they've learned some of the basic concepts about how we decode words in our language, but as I kind of alluded to earlier, they're falling down with the big chunky words. Or it could be that when we go back to the very basics that are taught in any reading instruction that takes a synthetic phonics approach, let's say in first grade, they can't even do those, even though they've been exposed to and you can see in the sequence of your core reading instruction, they should have learned these things. A vowel consonant E, a closed syllable type, common vowel digraphs or vowel teams. We can look a little bit deeper to find out where our, our areas of need are and calibrate our instruction and intervention accordingly to help these kids up, get over those barriers so that they can meet grade level expectations. That's the power of diagnostic assessment.
Still quick, still easy, still can be administered by a classroom teacher with sufficient time and resources provided to him or her. Progress monitoring is another type of formal assessment. These again are quick assessments collected frequently over time for students identified as needing more intensive instruction or intervention, and they're going to be used to determine if modifications made to intensify instruction have resulted in the students making the increased gains needed to allow them to catch up and meet expectations. Now, progress monitoring is a tricky thing that has a lot of conversations going around right now. Calibration of what you're monitoring so that you can actually see gains is going to be critical. I'm not going to get into the fray of arguing about this. I'm only going to highlight that you also are going to want to link into, let's say if you're using an ORF as a measure to measure if they're making gains to your instruction, you're going to want to make sure they're learning what you're teaching them. So maybe you find kids who have word reading deficits and are inaccurate. It might be really difficult if they're at a first grade reading level with their reading concepts and word concepts to move them if they're in fourth grade and your progress monitor is ORF. It's almost lunacy to think that you would see great gains on that because any gains that you really see are going to be based on sight, memory, and words anyway because of the complexity of the words that they're going to have in those. So you're going to want to have more of a proximal measure in addition to track and answer a fundamental question. Are they actually learning what I'm teaching? And then as you should expect to and see some of the words in those passages for the ORF, they should be reading accurately based on what you're seeing, is that transferring over to this other measure I'm using for progress monitoring, this oral reading fluency measure. Outcome evaluation. These provide outcome data for a group of students to determine if they have learned what has been taught. Outcome measures can be a summative assessment linked to a curriculum, so unit test I've been alluding to, or more global measures like a state standards um, that could be measured by state reading tests. So different tests for different purposes, all formal, all could have norms linked to them, or they could have criteria linked to them, all standardized in their approach to administration. Here's kind of a schematic of flow chart of how this can work. We always drive and start with the universal screening, and then we're going to categorize students using some type of decision rule into meeting expectations, falling behind expectations, and profoundly behind expectations. So universal screening. All students in a grade are tested at designated points during the school year. These data are used to differentiate instruction and determine <clears throat> the intensity of instruction and intervention that would be li likely needed for this student. These decision rules that I alluded to are going to be in place in a school or district. And this is going to set the expectations and cut points for risk based on either local or national norms um, for the screening instrument being used in your local context. Universal screenings are not going to allow you to diagnose any type of LD. They're not going to allow you to diagnose dyslexia. They're not going to allow you to do these more deeper dive types of evaluative types of things. They are merely a check engine light. Something is off. They will also tell you if a grade level expectation is not being met by a student. Characteristics of effective screening practices. I'd like to highlight five for you right now. One, as I alluded to earlier, they're valid and reliable. A valid measure assesses what is intended to measure right here and now. That's called concurrent validity. And it predicts future performance. That's called predictive validity. Both are needed. A reliable measure assesses the construct consistently over time. Second, a universal screener should be administered to all students in a grade level at multiple points during an academic year, ideally three, at minimum two. Three, effective universal screeners for reading problems directly measure a student's proficiency with reading and or pre-literacy constructs. These measures should be quick and easy to administer and can be administered by a classroom teacher as needed. The adoption of universal screening tools should be systemic and used consistently across a grade, a school, a district. And then five, data obtained from both universal screening and survey level assessment should be recorded, kept, and used to document the skills and knowledge of individual students. So in the canonical talk, we're at the student level. And we talk about why we're doing this is to impact our students and help our teachers know what to do for each student. 
and in the spirit of this screening data guide formal data team meetings used to make instructional decisions. Simple Simon. So three takeaways. One, universal screen all students on grade level reading skills. Two, we're going to use diagnostic or survey level assessments to determine if children flagged as at risk on universal screening have developed the reading skills they should have developed in earlier grades. And three, use screening data to make changes to instructional practices for students by using instructional intensifiers. And again, you can go to the Department of Education in Ohio's website and you can see um, online modules in which I talk about some of these intensifiers if you would like to. But I'd like to move to a different way of thinking about this, at least that's what people tell me. That we're so fixated on the individual child and the teacher or that interaction, we often fail to see that there are other uses of these data that are being untapped. So we live in an era of third grade reading guarantees and state mandated retention policies, yet the situation is a double blind. What is a double blind, you ask? A situation in the in which a person is confronted with two irreconcilable demands or a choice between two undesirable courses of action. Some folks think it is folly to advance students who fail the third grade reading test, arguing these students are unprepared for the schoolwork in higher grades. Of course, the alternative is to leave them in an educational context that failed to prepare them to pass the test in the first place. Which gets us to the reality that the optimal time to change an educational trajectory is well before students take a high stakes third grade reading test. When we explore student data at a higher level, they point to a larger scale of challenges. So uses of student data, here's number five, processes and systems evaluation. These provide outcome data to determine if reading systems are functioning optimally within an educational context. When pulled to higher levels, this information can inform the work of literacy leaders as they strive to support students, teachers, instructional practices under their supervision. Not the students, the teachers. Yes, we're going to use these to support the students, elevate their gains, but we can also use these to systemically elevate and support our teachers. Let's set the stage with some NAEP data to just drive home my point. You guys have seen these. I use pre-pandemic data. Eventually, I would have to turn the corner on this one and start using data after the pandemic, but we'll start before the pandemic. As you see, all students in our nation, the majority of them, are at or below basic levels on the NAEP. Now, what is the NAEP? It's actually a short reading test with a few passages and some multiple choice reading questions. What do we know about when they score at or below? They struggle with actually reading proficiently, with, with automaticity and accuracy. We know this from ongoing studies of the NAEP data to look under it to see what is being shown at these different levels. And that's troubling to me because that suggests that we're having a lot of kids who aren't being equipped with the foundational skills they need to answer a few multiple choice test questions to show that they understood what they struggled to read in the first place. Now, if we dig a little bit deeper, you guys know that there's a disproportionate percentage of kids from some communities not doing well on the NAEP. And it's our children of color who are doing disproportionately poorly on this measure, as well as our Hispanic students, which are also children of color, our black and brown kids out there in the world. So the takeaway is the majority of students are not proficient readers in this country, at least not on this quick measure in which they read a few passages and read some multiple choice questions. However, these data are from tests of reading comprehension, and these children have received four to five years of public education. Let that sink in. When you ask and want to retain kids, you punish them for having shown up for four to five years of schooling and say that they should leave their friends behind. They should be made to feel shame and blame because of what? What they did or didn't do? 
or what a system failed to do. I'm glad I wasn't held back in third grade. I'm glad I got to progress on. And I'm glad I didn't feel that additional shame of thinking that all that energy that I expended would hold me back even further and not allow me this opportunity to have overcome those adversities to present to you today. So let that think in. Four to five years of education has already been squandered and lost systemically. Not by the kid. The kid showed up. So whatever we do in this double bind, we need to think what the ramifications are and the consequences are. And then look to actual data and ask if it's actually causing real changes that can be linked directly to some type of a retention intervention. And let's just back up a little bit. These data are from fourth grade. High stakes reading achievement data start in third grade. What do we know about what's happening in K1 and 2? Because let's look at the screening data. We have those. That's being collected in almost every single public school in the country, people. And I would just argue these data should also be used by literacy leaders at various levels to identify ways and areas to aid educators and make systemic changes that can be supported and sustained long term to remove the double bind in the first place for the vast majority of the students, allowing us to find the small percentage who have some kind of predisposition that should make it difficult to begin with to learn how to read. As we consider these screening data, I'm going to take a simple view approach to categorizing students based on where they're at on the screeners. Now, Hollis swears that her rope is not the simple view of reading, but I do know that a lot of educators and parents find it to be very helpful in understanding the component processes that go into efficient reading. So let's just quickly run through her reading rope. There's two sides of it, or top and the bottom. We've got our language comprehension skills, our word recognition skills. As you see, there's a whole lot that goes into language comprehension, and there's some things that go into our ability to recognize words. We become increasingly strategic and, and automatic when it comes to these word recognition skills by my take of the literature. And we become increasingly strategic and automatic when it comes to the extraction of meaning and applying and activating gist and story structures and text structures. And these all bind together to allow us to become skilled readers. Now the simpler view is much more simple. It just looks at either decoding or word recognition and it looks at our oral comprehension and just simply ask some simple question. Are we doing what we should be doing for these things? Are we proficient or are we deficient? And it simplistically divides students up into these different reading profiles. You've got your typical readers who have both word recognition skills and the comprehension skills to allow them to understand text. You have kids who prototypically have been what we have called dyslexic in the past or individuals with dyslexia. And these are kids who are deficient in their word reading accuracy and spelling. And they're proficient and have demonstrated that they have background knowledge and vocabulary in these things. You've got these specific comprehension kids who have proficiency with their word reading skills, but they're deficient in their oral comprehension skills. And we have the mixed type, those kids who are deficient in both of these strands of the rope. Now I'm going to use universal screening data taken from one state, Arkansas. I've got data from other places to use too, but this is my biggest bolus of data. Um, Arkansas's NAEP data look nationally normal. They are not a urban center of places, um, and they are predominantly a um, white and black state that has a lot of economic disadvantage. Um, and there's a lot of rural communities. So is it representative of New York City? Not necessarily in that context. Are their NAEP scores similar? Yeah, they are actually. So anyway, let me just own that up. 
we are going to be looking at for the, these slides uh, one of the screeners that were used in this state, um, the iStation data. I use that because of its indicators that it has, and I'm going to showcase what these are. So I'm going to get some indicators of either emergent print skills, print skills, comprehension skills, and an overall composite school at kindergarten, first, and second grade. In kindergarten, I've got access to letter knowledge and phonemic awareness as measured by this um, screener. For comprehension skills, I have an oral vocabulary measure and a listening comprehension measure. I get an overall composite, which we will not be talking about for all four subtests. First grade, we get a decoding measure, a spelling measure, we get a reading vocabulary test and a reading comprehension test. And then in second grade, it switches to an oral reading fluency test, text fluency test, still have spelling, still have reading vocabulary, still have reading comprehension. And again, we still have a composite for all four of those measures. Now, we're going to operationally define, based on the technical manual for iStation, a high-risk Tier 3 status based on being below the 20th percentile in a component. We have four for each of those grade levels. Now, I'm going to subdivide each of these into print skills deficits, comp skills deficits, or that mixed type. They have some in both. And then I'm going to show you the total that are below tier three risk. And we're going to look at kindergarten, first, and second grade. Got 121 schools in this sample, got over 8,000 kids. As you can see in kindergarten, we have roughly a quarter of the students coming in that are struggling with their letter knowledge on phonemic awareness as this, based on this, this cut point criteria. We also have 28% who have a mixed profile. They have something in the print skills that is deficit. They've also got something in the oral comprehension that's deficit. We only have 11% who have just a um, comprehension, oral comprehension deficit. Yet we have 63% of the kids who coming into kindergarten are failing in some area or struggling and not set up to be ready to learn and have future success. You'll see these numbers shift and actually in a good direction here. So in this school year, we can see that 45% are not meeting expectation in one of those domains. We need some type of additional intervention or support based off of some implementations of MTSS. But then by second grade, we again see similar numbers. Now I would like to again highlight that the, the comp skills in first and second are always reading based. So you have a vocabulary on a reading test and you have a vo uh, reading comprehension, which of course is a reading test. So it's not surprising that we only have 1% of the students who are fitting with a pure comp skills deficit since comp is being measured by reading. So we would assume that if they were struggling, they would also be struggling with their word reading um, and that would be deflecting that down. But you can see that we don't have a high number of kids who are just struggling and need their reading comprehension improved. They're a mixed type or they actually aren't struggling too badly in the reading comp and vocabulary but they they're not doing what they should be doing on that print skills test. But more importantly we have over half the state or at least the half these 121 schools these students are struggling. Now this was the 2018-2019 school year pre-pandemic the same cohort of kids or so the same year so 2018-2019, kindergarten first, second grade students in these 121 schools. And in the state of Arkansas this year, 59% of the students were not proficient on the third grade high stakes reading test. We knew before they got to third grade that we weren't getting them what they needed. I don't think it's a double bind. I think it's cruel and unusual punishment to say that we have systems that aren't running the way they should and that we should now consider holding a kid back when we already knew using screening data that they weren't set up for success in the third grade. Now, I don't have the research study published yet, but we are engaged in a longitudinal study with the state of Arkansas, and we are using the universal screening tools used in the state to see if they predict passing the state's reading test 
to make sure that we know that we have the right calibration of tools and we can set local norms in the state in that context to make sure that they're being used and calibrated accordingly and finding those kids who are at risk for not passing and helping them far before they get to have to take that test, which in some states would result in a student being held back. Here's a quote from some colleagues of mine, Jenny Wanzak, Stephanie Alateva, Krista Masters. If many students in a grade level are struggling with meeting reading expectations after receiving core or supplemental instruction, the problem is likely to be the validity of the instruction or the fidelity of the implementation of the instruction, and not a sign of a need for very intensive interventions for many students. Another way of saying this is, it's not because of dyslexia, and it's not the child's fault. I would go one step further, and when we get to Act 3, I would argue it's not the teacher's fault either, and it sure as heck aren't parents' fault. Poor core reading instruction compounds over the years, creating schools populated by children who can't comprehend written language. They lack foundational reading skills, vocabulary, and background knowledge. Now, when we think about these data, we think about the individual as being the child. Let's take a step back. Let's use the school as our level of analysis. And let's look at the percentage of kindergarten students coming into a school on day one, at the beginning of the school year, not meeting expectations on an indicator on iStation. So again, I've got these same 121 schools. And on your x-axis, you see the percentage of kids in a school who aren't meeting expectations in one of those four indicators. You will see that well over, well, the majority of schools have over half the kids coming in needing a little bit of a boost or with predictive validity we would say not where they need to be for future reading success. So most of these schools had over half the kids not meeting expectations on at least one emergent literacy skill at the start of kindergarten. This is an indicator of a community risk factor. Not to blame the community. It's just the community that this school finds themselves in. That's the reality. That means the educational lift is going to be needed. you got to lift these kids up with the power of education. So what do we tend to do? We tend to only focus on the child and ask what predicts future success. We rarely ask what systems are needed to drive the success of all students within a school, an indicator of a school level resiliency factor. What systems allow for schools to give the lift to get kids to where they need to go? And as you know, we argue from research bases, prevention is needed to avoid unneeded heartache and suffering for children and parents and teachers. Because we all suffer. Prevention is also needed to cultivate the necessary context to identify and allocate limited resources to students who require more intensive sustained intervention efforts based on their rate of learning. What do I mean by that? Let's look at where the kids in these schools who get to be called dyslexia live. Where do they go to school? Who gets to have dyslexia in these schools? In which schools? And what do they look like? Well, we know something about that. So let's look at first grade data now from iStation. Got few fewer schools, 119, basically the same sample. Got over 6,000 kids in the sample. I'm gonna break these data up based on the ESSA grades for these schools. ESSA grades, where do they come from? Third, fourth, and fifth grade performance. Not K1 and 2 performance. ESSA scores and school ratings are based on third, fourth, and fifth grade data in elementary school. And they've been subdivided. A schools, B schools, C schools, D and F schools. Now, I'm gonna use slightly different labels. If they've only got these selective print skills deficits and no oral comprehension or comprehension deficits, we say that they have dyslexia. Steep criteria. They had to be below the 20th percentile on the measure of decoding and spelling. 
comprehension only kids had to be below the 20th percentile on vocabulary and reading comprehension and if you're a mixed type you had to be out on all four of those here are the data in our a schools you'll see that most of our kids are a mixed type but when we flip over to our dnf schools you can see that there's only almost three times as many kids who are mixed type and still the most prominent issue is going to be a mixed type. You will also notice that over half the kids in the DNF schools in first grade were not meeting expectations and at least two indicators on iStation. And you'll see that in the, tier, the, the A schools, you have about a quarter of the kids. Yet, 1% of the kids actually are labeled as having dyslexia in our DNF schools and a little over 5% of the kids in our A schools are labeled with dyslexia. However, when we take the dyslexia profile and what I would argue the mixed type, which also can be labeled as a dyslexia profile under state laws, you will see that behaviorally characteristics of dyslexia on the screener is far more prevalent in the DNF schools. However, it is the lowest base rate prevalence in these schools. Now there's lots of potential reasons for this, but I just want you to let that sink in. When we conceptually talk about MTSS and the thought leaders who have helped to drive this with lots of important research on this, they say that those parents me included, should just calm the heck down. Because if we just let MTSS work its way through, of course, what we'll have is a lot fewer kids who are not meeting expectations. Look, these high performing schools, that's exactly what we see. And that would actually drive down the identification rates of dyslexia. That is not what we see. And parents darn well know that. So there's a discrepancy between what in theory we should see, and in reality, what happens. And that discrepancy is causing conflict right now and is in part, I would argue, why we have so much dyslexia legislation. What in concept from the ivory tower should be working isn't what's actually happening. And the hard work is to get into the field and to figure out why that is and to support and make it better. What about these schools? What differentiates them? Well, A schools and B schools have a lot of white kids in them. D and F schools are over half black. In Arkansas, because of its demographics, the Hispanic population is fairly well distributed across these schools. But as I know one of my mentors always said, Reed Lyon, when you look at it and you boil it down, yes, ethnicity and race matters. It does. And there are cultural things that we need to consider above and beyond. And recently published research with Julie Washington helps to highlight that for my own research lab. Yet, there's almost 100% free and reduced lunch in the DNF schools. They're economically disadvantaged. And again, Arkansas, um, English language learners are universally Spanish-speaking Hispanic students and they're fairly well distributed as well. And most importantly, to my earlier points, they all show up to school. Those kids, they're showing up. I can't attest to what happens when they show up, but they're showing up. So three takeaways from this larger perspective. Student testing data has untapped potential to guide literacy leaders in their efforts to support teachers. Two, these data can highlight systemic underachievement well before the majority of students fail to pass a high stakes third grade reading test. And three, these data can also be used as indicators of the students coming to a school from a community and the resulting instructional burden placed on educational systems within a school can actually use them within the school then to see if a school has the right systems in place within its context to do the educational lifting that it needs to do. Act 3. 
I told you I was going to get here. So this is a different mindset for accountability. Let's set the scene. People talk lots about things when it comes to reading and reading instruction. Much, much of it simply doesn't matter. It is the distraction that takes our gaze away from what we can control, our behaviors. We must focus on doing what works to equip kids with the requisite skills to be lifelong readers. The act of doing this work falls to everyone. Each player has their role in promoting the magic moments of teacher-student interaction that allow for the learning of skills and knowledge that permit students to engage thoughtfully with text in various settings. To read text is a gift that is not given but earned through the student's efforts, efforts made possible by everyone playing their role. Think about that for a second. You're not saving children. You're enabling them to do a lot, a lot, a lot of hard work. And for those of us who were born with a diathesis to struggle, you're giving us an enabling context to do a whole heck of a lot of our own work. I don't need a bloody savior. I need people to support me to do the work that I need to do. Pick me up when I fall, pat me on the back when I do well, and make sure that I know that I'm still a person worthy of love. But if you're a savior and you got a complex, kick it to the curb right now. There are a whole lot of layers. We got policymakers, we got State Department of Education, we got regional education service centers, we got school districts, we got schools, we got teachers, we got students. They are all pressing down and they're all very expensive. Very expensive. Anybody who's ran budgets and ran an organization knows what your most expensive line item is and it's the people you pay and their benefits. Bottom line it is, any entrepreneur out there who runs his or her own business, how to start it from scratch. You know that those people and their benefits are your largest line item. Anybody who works for a state agency and runs a budget knows that. Anybody trying to get grants to fund research or some initiative knows this. Anybody who works to run organization knows that people are our most valuable resource and they cost us the most. So who are these people in each layer? We need to know that. We're spending a lot of money on it. What are their responsibilities? What are they doing? What are they doing? How do they support student outcomes? What are valid and reliable indicators of efficacy to track their efforts? We seem to want to put valid and reliable efforts on the work that students are doing, enabled by teachers and hopefully enabled by a larger context. I, I don't, I got, I got squat for re indicators about other people. What sources of data do they need to, to help inform their efforts? So let's start, we, we know what they're supposed to do. What do they need to do their jobs? And what do they need to know to effectively carry out their responsibilities? What do they need to know and what skills do they have to have? A considerable investment is made in human capital. We need to more fully understand how to use these resources to support students and teachers in the classroom. And we need to do work. We need to get out there and do it. We need to get out of the cheap seats, everybody. What are cheap seats? Those are for people talking and not doing. So I'd ask you to get on the field, coach on the sidelines, or get in the cheering section. But I do think as a society, we need to ask who are the season ticket holders for the cheap seat, not getting on the field to do the work, to support that magic moment between students and teachers, that enable those students to do a truck ton full of work for themselves to read. Those folks in the cheap seat, they're more than happy to preach about what a shame it is that teachers should know more and know better and do better. 
Mm-mm-mm. Honey, ain't it a shame that you just don't know more? Ain't it a shame that you went to four years of college and you're in student loan and debt and you just don't know what you need to know, honey? Ain't it a shame? Shame on you. Shame on you. Let's just be honest. Knowing better doesn't help a darn bit. Doesn't do a darn bit of good when teachers are not empowered through systems to apply that knowledge to do better. And sadly, teachers are often not even held accountable for what they are doing in the first place. What do I mean by that? Well, first, I'm going to own that quote right there. Yeah, I said that. All right, here's what I mean. Let's break it down. Again, what can we control? Control home behaviors. Those are we control. I control myself. And I can control myself within a system. And some systems aren't going to allow me to engage in certain types of behavior. So we need to know teacher behavior. And then we got outcomes. And we got success. And how do we hold them accountable? Well, does a student pass a test or not? And what test? Typically, a high stakes reading test, first given in the third grade. But we often don't go in and look and see what teachers are doing. We don't know what they're doing. They could be doing exactly what they're directed to do by their leadership. And what happens when a person does what he or she is directed to do and meets with failure again and again. It's called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness is a condition in which a person suffers from a sense of powerlessness arising from a traumatic event or persistent failure to succeed. It is thought to be one of the underlying causes of depression. Student behaviors, that's what they can control and be held accountable for as well. Are they engaging in what the teacher is enabling them to do? I would argue literacy leaders should know what teachers are doing in the classroom and if students are engaged in learning. They should be held accountable for producing valid and reliable indicators of these behaviors and using them to support learning in their schools. I think that's what leadership should be held accountable for. Are they doing their jobs? Are they getting into the classroom? Do they have systems to track and monitor the implementation of what they're directing their teachers to do? And are there students in those classrooms engaging in that work? I think they need to do it because it's their job. I also think they need to do it because it's the only way to drive outcomes and to make inferences about where they're coming from. So thought question. Suppose teachers' performance were based on their classroom behavior and adherence to instructional practices specified by literacy leadership coupled with data on student engagement. Our conversations, I would suggest, would be vastly different. We're implementing program X. We want to see base level implementations by the second quarter. We'll be coming into your classrooms to see how you're doing and if your students are engaging in this learning. And we're going to put coaching in place to support you and make sure we get to full levels of implementation and innovation by the second year of implementation. We're going to be tracking student monitoring on an ongoing basis linked to levels of implementation to see if those changes and innovations are actually driving increased student success. We're going to hold you accountable for doing what we asked you to do and when we give you support and ask you to make improvements, you making those improvements. Sounds like a place I'd want to work. Sounds like a leader I'd want to work under. Because when I do that, I know if a teacher is doing what she was directed to do. I know if a student engages in expected learning outcomes. And if I see a teacher doing what she's been directed to do with an intervention, instruction and a student engages in that and then they pass those tests I can make some inferences I can make one inference as a leader I've identified 
that the instructional practices and learning experiences that teachers can implement that lead to student engagement are currently sufficient in the context they're being implemented. In this context, with this population of students, teachers doing X as asked, students engaging in that learning seems to be leading to student learning outcomes in this context. We might see this too. We might see teachers doing what they're supposed to be doing. Students engaging in the expected learning outcomes. But we could still see failure, guys. You could still see failure. But the failure is not because the teacher didn't do what she was directed to do and the students didn't engage in that learning. This isn't an issue with your personnel, folks. They did what you asked them to do. And it's not an issue of your students not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They showed up and engaged. So it resides in what literacy leadership has directed teachers and students to do. The blame lies with the captain of the ship. Now, it doesn't have to be a blame game here. The opportunity lies with the team to strategically innovate and find out what changes can be made to the behaviors and practices to engage students in opportunities for them to learn more and do better. Leadership must support the modification of instructional practices and learning experiences and track outcomes based on these modifications. Sounds a lot like RTI. A little bit of dose of what you tell your teachers to do here, folks. State Department of Ed's goes for you too. A little bit of a dose of what you tell those teachers to do. See those same practices apply upstream with what you're responsible to do and what you should be doing. Because that right there is a recipe for learned helplessness. The teacher did what you asked her to do. The students showed up and they still failed. I would suggest that leadership must promote agency and empower teachers in the classroom by supporting the implementation of effective practices within an educational context. That's going to mean that we're going to have to have systems in place to do this iterative work within each educational context. Because what works in one context may not be sufficient in another context. Just to highlight one reason, the community risk is going to be variable based off a of context. Just one indication of that. Now, there are these instances, and I go into classrooms all over the country. I support teachers. I go into district offices all over the country. There are instances when I walk into classrooms and teachers are not doing what he or she is directed to do. And when they don't do that, students can't engage in learning opportunities. And you got failure over here. However, we still have to reflect as leaders. We need to know why are the teachers not doing what he or she is directed to do? And consider if the need is for additional training and support or if the non-compliance is personnel based. Is this an HR conversation or is this the need to have a conversation about my systems in place? Is it isolated to a handful of teachers or is it system wide? Now in one district I support it was fairly system wide and it was because there was trepidation with the implementation of a new rigorous or um, reading program K through five. They were knew that they were prying, there was a huge pressure on state reading outcomes in this district and they were worried that the new curriculum really wouldn't be teaching to and meeting the standards. And so there was anxiety that they were going to be punitively handled because their kids didn't come in with what they needed and that they could fall back to and resolve that anxiety by using older systems and procedures that they wanted made them feel comfortable to go back to what they used to do. So how do we overcome that challenge? Communication. Identify that that is go in, listen, and actually hold space for and hear what those teachers are really experiencing. Acknowledge that that's real. Normalize that. Anxiety is real, folks. Change is hard. And accountability, that's even harder. So conversations around 
getting out there with walks through the classroom to make sure that we want to see you doing what we're asking to do. We're going to be monitoring that. We're going to keep that in mind. Knowing that this is the first year of implementation and that we shouldn't be necessarily at full implementation in the first year was an important thing for leadership to context. And most importantly was to say, if you do what we ask you to do and you make these sacrifices now, we'll have your back when the data get published. Most important thing. We're going to hold you accountable for doing what we asked you to do. And we're all in this together. And let's talk about context. Those in spite of you schools. In some instances, students will receive effective instruction because mommy and daddy get it for them outside of school. I know I got my kid instruction outside of school. I could. And I did. And I feel no shame in that. As a parent of a struggling reader who I held crying at night, I did what I did as a parent, and I'm not ashamed of it. But it doesn't mean that I don't go out there and fight for those teachers. Because I'm not in that classroom. I didn't sign up for their job. And so if I'm not willing to do it myself, I better darn well find a way to support and enable and listen and learn about what they really need to do the job that they signed up and want to do in the first place. So we can't expect the in spite of its uh, schools to be the models of exemplary behavior. Because we don't have an indicator of how many of those parents are going outside of the school and how much is happening at home that supports and leads to those learning outcomes. So if I'm a district leader who I support, I'm going to be asking them to track trends across different contexts and populations of students to determine why certain practices or lack thereof may work for some students and not others. And not to blame communities or different people, but to say that educational lift needs to be commiserate with what we're dealing with. And we're going to lift them up. So just to be concrete, what may work for kids who come into kindergarten with an early risk of reading failure and are not on free or reduced lunch may, be and not, may not be effective for students with the same risk who are not on free and reduced lunch status. Or it could be that both groups benefit from the same instructional supports and what difference is how critical the instruction is for a student. Let me rephrase that. The same instructional methods and approach may be needed and appropriate for the vast number of kids within any context, but how mission critical it is that they get it may be more important for some kids than others, and we should keep that in mind. So the lift that educators must achieve with some contexts is greater than the lift in other contexts due to the overall global risk profile of the students. So there's the full model. It's a simple model. It's only part of my model that I'm developing with some other groups across the country to try to help us understand how we develop systems and we change systems for the support of everybody in the ecosystem. And we move away from the cheap seats and we engage in the work. So accountability, three takeaway points. One. All levels of the educational landscape should be held accountable for their behaviors and their role in student learning outcomes. Accountability requires actionable, valid, and reliable data documenting teacher and student behavior. Let me repeat that. Accountability requires actionable, valid, and reliable data documenting teacher and student behavior. Three. Literacy leadership should use these data to inform their efforts to implement a systems-based approach to monitoring and modifying the instructional practices of teachers and instructional staff under their supervision. And that's not easy work. It's hard work. It's work that takes clear communication, expectations, and a little bit of tear and heartbreak along the way. 
anyway, you can screen tweet at me if you'd like. More than happy to get those and ignore them. Because um, I'm busy, guys. I'm out there in the field. I'm on the sidelines and I'm in the cheering section. They ain't got no time for people screaming at me from the cheap seats. Because on the field, I can't hear you anyway. Love you guys. Take care and be good.